This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes! Welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a legendary screenwriter and a very versatile one at that. He has uh, written so ma- he has written lots of different types of 80s classics. I am talking about Michael Janover. Michael, um, of course, uh, wrote, he co-wrote uh, the Jerry Lewis movie Hardly Working, which was his comeback vehicle, 1981. He also uh, co-wrote the 1984 John Carpenter-produced classic The Philadelphia Experiment. He also uh, wrote the Mr. Boogity Disney TV movies. Uh, a lot of us a lot of us 80s kids out there, we remember those, and it's going to be great to have him on the show today. He also wrote an episode of The Hitchhiker as well that I'm going to ask him about. And, um, you know, a lot of you know that I, I don't like to badmouth other people. Um, you know, I really don't. But I just wanted to mention, you know, as, you, as a lot of you know, last year, last summer, I had this girl on my podcast. She invited me on hers. And then, you know, shit got weird. And I may have been exploited. I don't know. But just things got really weird, almost in a jealous and competitive kind of way on her part. And she announced a couple days ago on Facebook that she was ending her podcast. Well, God bless. I hope um, she, um, you know, goes on to the next endeavors with lots of vigor and the same amount of energy that she did when she started her podcast. And thanks for having me on, despite whatever weirdness happened. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Michael Janover. Hi. Hey, Michael. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for being interested. (laughs) Absolutely. So, going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward writing early on in your childhood? Um, no, I don't think so. But uh, I noticed that I, I I could write, and I, I did it pretty well in high school and junior high school and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But I never, when I was, when I went into film, I never thought of myself as a writer until I, I got good at it, I guess. I, I found that I had a knack for it. Yeah, so your original trajectory was going into film? Yeah, well, actually, even before that, I never thought, I had no idea what I was going to do in college. And one day... I said, you know, you ought to, I asked, do you have any film classes here? This was at the University of Colorado. This guy was head of the theater department. He said, no, but you should take an acting class. And I said, what, me? Get on stage? You got to be kidding. And uh, I did it, and uh, I found out that I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you- and that's what pushed me. I, I I uh, got into this Shakespeare Festival whole thing, and then I even thought of going off to school to be uh, a theater major. But no, my I, my calling was movies, and so that's where I, I detoured away from theater and to, toward movies. Do you, Do you remember the first movie you ever saw? First movie? I think I do. Actually, it was a John Wayne movie. I think John Wayne. Yeah. About a, he was about a test pilot or something. Oh, um, post World War II jet pilot movie. I don't know. Oh yeah, that's like one of those notorious, you know, bad movies. <laughs> it was a, yeah, it wasn't that good, but it was the first time I was in a movie theater alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in that case, in that respect, it was it was memorable. Yeah, I heard it like took seven years for that movie to be released. It was so bad. <laughs> Okay, good. Oh, yeah. It was shot in, like, 1950, and it came out in 57. Uh, I was looking back at 
movies that made a major impact in my life. In 1953, mm -hmm. that's when I saw, what did I see? Uh, I think I saw War of the Worlds and Invaders from Mars in 1953. Good one. Shortly thereafter was, uh, what was that one where you touch someone and they change? Uh, um. I can't remember the, the title. But yeah, those things scared the hell out of me. And they stayed with me. And I, and I left it. I guess I loved being scared. <laughs> Those are good ones. Yeah, I, I actually interviewed Ann Robinson. We talked about The War of the Worlds. Oh, God, that was great. Yeah, great movie. Didn't like the remake so much, but it's a good movie. No, and it, it really helped to be like seven years old <laughs> <laughs> when you're watching it. Yeah. So, yeah. Are you, are you uh, born and raised in New York? I was born and raised until I was, let's see, when did we leave New York? I was about seven or eight years old. We moved to Colorado. I I really wish we'd stayed in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Colorado's probably I mean, too cold. Was, I, I still have fond memories. Well, we lived about, uh, we lived a subway stop from Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So after, uh, so, so, um, wh where did you go to college? I went to the University of Colorado. Mm -hmm. And then later on, uh, I decided to, to, to go all in on the movies. And I, and I applied to USC and UCLA. I got accepted to both, which surprised the hell out of me. Yeah. And I chose UCLA. It's, um, and I was glad. It was good. UCLA was good. I mean, I learned it. I, it, it's hard to write about movies unless you understand how to make them, how they're made. It, it's, a te, it's a very technical uh, business. Yeah. And if, and if you write stuff that you can't really do easily in a movie it, because you don't know any better, you, it, your, your story won't work as well. Your screenplay won't work as well. So yeah. having that background in making movies, even if it's just in college or working on someone else's movies, it's really helpful. Yeah, and so you were taking film at UCLA? Mm hmm Did you have any... I got an MFA in in fact, which really helped me. I'm yeah. joking. <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah. once was I ever asked, did you get a degree in film? <laughs> they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you have an encounter with Jim Morrison? That was the year before me. Oh, okay. Funny you should ask that. But I did ask, I said, he was here? Yeah, just last year. I said, well, what kind of movie did he make? He said, and I, said, I think, as I recall, it was a, all I remember was it was a dominatrix whipping a television set. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that sounds right. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, because I interviewed this filmmaker, Nettie Pena. She was in a, cl a class with him, and she used to hang out with the Doors all the time. Oh, interesting. I found out recently there's a couple of UCLA graduates in the area who were there about that time. Oh, the yeah? One was in the theater department. Oh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> so, so you graduate from UCLA, and then uh, what do you do after? Well... I fought back and forth between leaving Los Angeles and going back to Colorado, and I did this a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And the first time, I just I was intimidated, intimidated by the size of Los Angeles. Yeah. And I just wasn't prepared for it. So I went back. I was there a year. The good thing is I met my wife there. <laughs> nice. And, uh, and then I came back, and I finally went all in. It took me a year before I even could talk to someone about getting, you know, an agent. That's the first thing you had to do is get an agent before anybody would look at you. And I finally got one, and then I was off. So, so did you begin with Hawaii Five-0? Hawaii Five-0 sort of came to me. I'm trying to remember how that happened. I had never seen Hawaii Five-0. Yeah. And I got a job being a story editor. And I thought, this is weird. And the only time I'd ever seen it was when I'd visit my, my parents. My father seemed like he was always watching Hawaii Five-0, <laughs> but I never paid attention to it. So when people said, when I said, I, well, I got this job on Hawaii Five-0 as a story, a story editor, no less. And uh, they, they would say to me, book him Dano. And I would look at him, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 
yeah, but you know what? The first week of uh, uh, being there, they uh, Jack Lord, yeah, he's, he's got to go to Hawaii. Yeah. Okay, so I, I was getting, I, I said I'm getting married though. The, you know, the woman I met in back in Colorado says, well, where are you going to take your honeymoon? So I'll see you in Jamaica. Well, what about Hawaii? Hmm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, did you have to deal with Jack Lord a lot while you were doing it? No. In fact, he insisted that I go there, and so I went to the set while I was there, because nobody said, you know, do this, do that, go here, go there. So I went to the set where they were filming, and I went up to him, and apparently, this is what someone told me, after I went up and met him, he, he walked away and he asked, who the hell is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like we're in J JL people, Jerry Lewis and Jack Lord, the two notorious JLs of my life. But no, he hardly had anything to do with him at all. I, was, I did become a story editor for a while in Los Angeles. And that was that was really interesting. Yeah, I, I heard Jack Lord was a handful, and it's not surprising that after Hawaii Five O, he didn't have a career. I'm sure, you know, word got. He took his last name very seriously. Yes. <laughs> Good way of putting it. Yeah, I think that you know word got out. You know, uh, during those twelve years or whatever the show was on, that uh, that he was difficult, and I think that's what what killed his career after Hawaii Five O. Yeah, yeah, people can become divas in yeah. this business, especially stars. People, you know, they believe the world, they begin to believe the world, the universe gravitates around them. Oh yeah, especially people who struggled, you know. Um, Eric Estrada, by the time he got on Chips, you know, he thought that he was king <laughs> shit. Um, all the guys who were on Hill Street Blues uh, were divas, I heard. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it can happen when you're on a hit series, especially. Yeah. Well, you get all that adoration, and everybody's bringing you bagels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I get you anything else? No, no. Uh, it, 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 it can get inside you. It can get in your head. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's crazy. So how did you uh, come to uh, collaborate with Jerry Lewis? Ah. Uh, well, I wrote the script... One of the times I went back, my father, you know, I I came from a bad, let me back up here before. Okay. I back up, uh, I came from a relatively poor background. My father was a, worked for the mail, or the U.S. mail, and uh, he was very unhappy about it. And so one time when I went back, I was, I, I took a job as a mailman. And that, when I was walking along one day delivering the mail, I, I began to think back to UCLA. Do uh, you know who George Melies was? I've heard of him, yeah. He was one of the first people. It's an argument as to whether Thomas Edison or George Melies invented films. I think it was Melies who did it. And he, he made a little movie about these kids and, a, and, a, and someone turning off and on the, uh, the hose. And they would look up the hose and would come on mysteriously because this guy was playing a joke on him. It was like a minute long. And I, when I was walking past this one house and the, the sprinklers were on, and I like came back to me. And I began thinking about movies again. Began thinking about, uh, and and the first movie I wrote was about a clown who becomes a mailman. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was based on my experiences somewhat for that time, that, uh, that escape to, New to Denver. Yeah. yeah Turned it's... it into a, a funny movie. That was the Jerry Lewis movie, wasn't it? Yes. Hardly Working. Hardly Working, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. The agent I had at the time, she loved the movie and she said, I think I can get Bob Hope. And I thought, Bob Hope? <laughs> That's when I first had doubts about her. <laughs> <laughs> no way. So anyway, I don't Oh, How did Jerry Lewis get involved? That was a funny story. Someone who, who, who uh, one of the producers of Hardly Working was literally a butcher uh -huh. in the valley. Literally a butcher. But mm -hmm. as a side, 
practice, he also had what, in his own words, the best Elvis impersonator in the world that he managed. <laughs> and so he said, I, you know, I go to Las Vegas all the time because of, you know, Elvis. And I know Jerry Lewis. I can, I can get this to Jerry Lewis. And I guess he did. I guess he did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so impersonators that was just a funny way to get started and then when I finally went out to meet this guy he literally came out from the back you know wiping the blood off his hands on his white jacket <laughs> that, was, that was the producer of the movie yeah the other guy was, a, there was some guy I never met was some guy in Venezuela who had hotels it was but you know you do what you do yeah. I was just really happy to have the movie done it was, it was like a major step yeah, this is Jerry Lewis was a huge, you know, as my agent said, the good news, you know, I suppose this is going to help, you know, uh, this first movie getting done. Well, the good news is Jerry Lewis, but the bad news is Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So did you and him, um, did you write drafts together? No, he did. I didn't see him ever until... One night, uh, someone who was, I was living in L.A. again, and someone called me and said, Jerry Lewis is going to be having, at UCLA, literally, screening uh, some stuff from the movie. And I said, you know, I hadn't seen anything or been invited or talked to. It was just little clips. He's in, he's in Florida making this movie. And uh, so this was a chance, because, you know, so we snuck in the back. <laughs> of the theater, there was about 20 people there right up front, and he showed some, showed some scenes from the movie, which is funny, because the first time I think I ever saw him was, he was in Denver showing scenes from The Nutty Professor. Mm -hmm. uh, so the second time I ever saw him, he was showing scenes from my movie, isn't this ironic? Um, that's how I met him, because as he was leaving the theater, I, I said, hi, I'm, I'm Mike Janover. And uh, he said, and he looked at me like, do I know you? <laughs> and he said, well, oh, Michael, he said, we did the best we could under the circumstances. And I was just reading up on it. And it, was a, it was a lot of problems while they were making it. Yeah. Particularly money. He, I think he went, Jerry Lewis went bankrupt during that period of time. Oh yeah, he had. I think he had to get some investors from Europe or something, and it it was. Well, one was this guy from Venezuela, this hotel guy. Right. Right. Who ran out of who ran out on the film, so he was left high and dry. The movie was lucky to be made. Yeah, I know. Finished. I know. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite movies of his because he showed a, um, such a vulnerability in that movie that he didn't show in his earlier movies, and I think a part of it was because. He uh, was older by that point, and also too, I think uh, you you really with with whatever you wrote that he used, I think you brought you you brought out the the best in him in that movie. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I read a a critic uh, wrote a review of the movie in which he compared it to Charlie Chaplin's Limelight because, like in that movie, Chaplin's persona was older and, and mature. Yeah, I know the movie. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great movie. Charlie Chaplin was one of my heroes. Oh yeah, one of the the greats. Uh, that's that's so cool though. You got to you got to uh, write his comeback movie, you know, because he he had taken a break and just focused on the telethons, and of course he had a dope addiction during those ten years that he was taking a break. Yeah, but that's pretty cool. You got to write his comeback film. Yeah, and he and he got to direct it. He he was really the at the end he was the producer as well. Yeah. What's up? Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think too. You know, because the, the movie had run into uh, trouble um, uh, production-wise, the movie has kind of a, a TV movie of the week quality to it, whereas, you know, Jerry's earlier films that he directed, you know, um, look look really, really good, you know, because he, you know, he's the pioneer of the video assist. Right, yeah, and he wrote that book about making films. Yeah. D did he direct The Delicate Delinquent? Um, that was his first sole, that you was, know, non... That was Don McGuire who, who directed that. Okay. 
Yeah, but that was his first, first time when he was w- without Dean Martin. Yes, I recall. first solo movie. Yes, he didn't direct until um, The Bellboy in '60. Okay, I remember that The Bellboy. Yeah, it was like a s- series of uh, sketches, one after the other. Yeah, it, it was a pretty experimental film for Paramount. It drove them nuts, but you know it made money, and so then he was able to direct more conventional stuff. Um, well, he certainly knew new film, you know. Oh yeah, coming and going and, and performing, and, and you know his comedy. He's you know he is a genius. I I think if he hadn't been so ego driven, he could have been just. Yes, a, that's his problem. He could have been a straight director. The Jerry, the JL problem, Jack or Jerry Lewis. Right. He could he could have been just a straight director and not even be in his own films if if he had wanted to, you know. But you know, when you're a star, you love being in the center of the limelight. Mm-hmm. It's 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 part of what drives you, and I think that's that was him. He was a performer. Yeah, I do know that his son is writing a book with um, this guy who wrote a book about the Rat Pack recently, and um, the guy the guy dropped some hints in an interview that I was listening to where he reveals there's some pretty dark stuff in there that the uh, the, the world has has never heard before that they're going to hear. Yeah, including bisexuality. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> this is new to me. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Ugh. It's gonna. Be, I, I can't wait for that book. It's gonna be pretty interesting. So then, um, you do uh, the Philadelphia Experiment. How did that come about? Ah, uh, the Philadelphia Experiment. Um, how did that woman call me? And I, I met this woman. I'm trying to remember where I met Peggy. Peggy was one of the producers on that. Mm-hmm. And I had been introduced to her by someone, and she was trying to move something that I had written. And then it didn't work, but she called me because she was, cause she was involved with this. And, and would I be interested in it? They didn't want to make this movie about the Philadelphia Experiment. I had no idea what that was, none. none. But I was called into a meeting, and John Carpenter was there, as well as a, a few other people. And John Carpenter had just finished a, a version there have been like six or seven writers before me and the producer the reason she called me in is because this was he was looking to get financing from a studio and he had tried six major writers and not one of them had been able to come up with a solution to to this making a movie out of the philadelphia experiment and Mm -hmm. that's why what is the philadelphia experiment in 1943 i think it was um the navy and I thought that he was making this up. The Navy had an experiment where they were trying to make a, a ship uh, mm. invisible to radar. And the the legend is that it actually disappeared and showed up miles away in mm. some other part of, uh, I forget where it was, somewhere on the East Coast. Um, and uh, I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I came up with with uh, an idea. I mean, John Carpenter's idea was that it was it was a conspiracy. I thought, why would there be a conspiracy about making? Why would they try to hide something like that? Didn't mm-hmm. make sense to me. Um, so I said, you got to make it in happening now instead of trying to cover up something in the past. So I came up with this story idea, and finally they sold it. They sold it on my idea, so I wrote it. Um, that's how. It came about. I came up with a solution to their their uh, problem, getting getting studio financing for it. Yeah, because uh, because I had read that uh, he he had uh, Carpenter had written um, an earlier draft, and he tried. I to... have that draft, yeah, because I that's one of the drafts I read. Yeah, because he had tried to get it made at Avco Embassy after he did The Fog, but they said the movie was too big, so then he gave them Escape from uh, New York instead. When I met him, I said, God, it's it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm such a fan of, of, uh, oh, was it was, that first horror movie he did that was so scary. Halloween. Halloween. I'm such a fan of Halloween. He said, well, I'm such a fan of Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's he said, cool. Yeah, I thought, really? Oh, yeah. So that was fun. 
meeting him. I I was really impressed. And he had a really nice writing style, but he just didn't know where to go with it. Yeah. I mean, with the story. That's all. And and you co-wrote with Bill Gray? No, I did not. He got credit. Uh But that story was all me. I kind of, I was kind of angry that, why am I sharing credit? This is nothing like the other stuff that, that had been done. The whole time travel thing that's, ever, that's been in every single uh, version of this movie, well, that was me. And I said, I went to the writer's school. I said, why is this? Well, how come I, I'm having to share credit? Well, because there was someone else writing about it. So I mean, if somebody's going to write about shooting Abraham Lincoln, just because they decide to do that, and then the whole other story has nothing to do with anything in that other version. Just because they decided to write something about Abraham Lincoln getting shot, they get shared credit. They say, "Yep." <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it worked. I did meet William Gray at one time, though. Yeah, I mean, he's so got for this this script. It was me. <laughs> it was me. That's good. I'm gonna beat my own drum on that one. Yeah. <laughs> He's got some great movies: The Changeling, Prom Night, Black Moon Rising. He That's William some... Gray. Yeah, William Gray. He he wrote I all did those. Did not know that. Yeah. Do you do you know of New World? Nice guy. Really nice guy. I just did. Yeah. I never had any contact with him until later. Yeah. Did you did did you know that uh, when when Mel Gibson's movie Forever Young came out, they compared it to this movie? Yeah, because it's the same idea, you know, a guy from the 40s is now in present day and he finds out that, um, um, that his, he, he finds out that he, his girlfriend from, from back then is still alive in present day and, um, his friend died at a certain point. I mean, it's not quite like that, but it's similar. Well, see, that was me. That was a time travel thing because all I, I heard was, during the experiment, presumably Einstein was there, and so Einstein, I think, well, you know, time travel, right? Right. <laughs> so I said, let's add time travel to it, and that has become identified with with all those stories since. But uh, it made it, it seems like a natural to me. Time yeah. travel. Do Do you know if New World yeah. it was New World attached when you were writing? I think that came later when they came to to uh, distribution that they got involved. Because I, I find it so interesting that they distributed it because just like Avco Embassy at that time, you know, they were a smaller studio, and then this movie ended up what like twenty one million. I read that uh, the budget ended up being. No, I don't know. They should they sure didn't spend a lot on the writer though. <laughs> you didn't even you didn't even you didn't even come close to getting that much, huh? I had my friend was my lawyer at the time, and she said, "You know, they negotiated a sub uh, industry uh, deal for you." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Really?" Because I was just happy to get the job, but it was it was I was being underpaid, apparently. Yeah, it helped. I mean, the, the movie helped, obviously. Mm, absolutely. I, I think it's a, it's a it's a damn good movie. I, I watch it quite frequently. I have it on VHS, as a matter of and fact. And I love science fiction. That's, you know. Yeah. War of the Worlds, and Naders from Mars, all that. Yeah, did you, did, did you, come, did you come up with the, um, the arcade game explosion? The arcade game? I didn't know there was an arcade game. Yeah, there's a scene where you know they're in the they're in the truck stop, you know, and you know the the locals are like, you know, get out of here, we don't want your kind in here. And then because he's because the friend is like, you know, dying, you know, from from being in present day because the older right. self is in present day, he like you know blows up an arcade game in the um, in the truck stop. Hmm. I no, I did not know that. Yeah. That's, yeah, I was unaware of that. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's pretty funny. I, I love that scene. When they filmed that stuff with the going through the lemon trees and everything, that was that turned. We, Sally and I moved there later on. We didn't know it. You know, they were shooting it there, but that was outside of Ojai, California. Yeah, that's a pretty good uh, coincidence there. Yeah. You World you. Is full of them. Yeah. You wrote you wrote um, an episode of uh, the Hitchhiker. Yeah, and I wrote a second one. I, I wrote I 
I wrote one of, I think it was called Man at the Window or something like that. Yes. It was about this guy who was a voyeur and he's, and, uh, he's peering at feet and, uh, he catches this guy having an affair yeah. and he's caught looking through the window and, and he, he was assuming that this guy was, that the woman was having an affair with this guy. She was actually having an affair with another woman, which back then would, would, it was a shock. And, uh, yeah, that was something. Did they ever make that movie or am I just imagining it? They made the episode, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was only one uh, credit of uh, of uh, Hitchhiker on your IMDb. I always find that out. Like I, I say, you know, you wrote this ep- you wrote an episode of this, and they're like, I actually wrote several episodes, but they're not on IMDb. Hmm. Nope, that was it. That was it. I mean, the uh, the story editor on that was kind of a little strange. You know, he had his take on the on. Uh, my, I, the guy who was involved in that story was a, a blue collar guy. And his take on him was, well, you know, when he comes home, he should put on his smoking jacket. And I said, what? A smoking jacket? <laughs> Where's the smoking jacket? <laughs> Is it, I guess that's something out of the 40s? I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, you always get suggestions like that in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what's the weirdest thing you can suggest? Hmm, maybe this guy should wear a smoking jacket. <laughs> you know, this <laughs> telephone repairman wearing a smoking jacket. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, like Hugh Hefner, you know. Um, yes. We both have the first name Hugh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I grew up loving the Mr. Boogity movies. Um, I would watch them all the time when I was a kid, whenever they were on. And um, I read that uh, you had a script called Cheap Thrills, which was meant to be um, a yes, Cheech and Chong Cheech movie. And Chong. Yes, I actually, I just interviewed Tommy Chong like last week, and I wish I had known this then. I would have asked him. <laughs> he had nothing to do with it, though, yeah. until the end. I got it. Okay, let me tell you a little story about this. Okay. Um... I went in for a meeting and I said, to Ch- uh, Cheech and Chong's manager, you know, they're trying, they got a deal at Columbia and, in, you know, want to come in and talk to them. So uh, I went in and met them. I thought that was going to be it. I said, so do you have any ideas? And I thought, oh, shit, I wasn't prepared for this. So I thought of a movie I was going to make as a student that I never got around to doing, it, just a short movie at UCLA. And it was basically, um, what's that movie? It was, a, it was about a geriatric vampire. It was a scene where it's kind of a Dracula comes in through the moonlit window, the French window, and the beautiful blonde to sleep on the four-poster bed. And he, But he's staggering. He's so old, he can barely get in the window, and he pulls his... He gets, he's he's uh, doing his... La- not to launch it, his Bella Lugosi thing. Yeah. And uh, then he drops... He leans over to bite her neck, and his false teeth fall out. And uh, I get, you know, I got a laugh. The guy, the people I told us, I got a laugh. And I got, so I got the job on the basis of this movie I didn't make yet. It was just a, a, a visual gag that I came with at the, on the moment because I had nothing. I didn't know I was going to be pitching. Um, mm. So that's how that came about. That's how that... Uh, is, is, is the first uh, Mr. Boogie D influenced by Poltergeist? Oh, Mr. Boogity. Mr. Boogity came about because I had, oh, I'm sorry, I, I left the rest of the story out. Um, I, wrote the, I wrote the script for, for this thing. For, that was, the Chief and Chong wasn't necessarily going to be in it. Yeah. But it was about a family that moves into a haunted house. It was pretty crazy. It was like airplane style. Mm-hmm. And uh, at one point, the father is, is, uh, is uh, it's like the Amityville house. And the father is possessed by a demon only he's possessed in his ass and his ass gets bigger and bigger and then he grows a face on it and starts ro- running him around <laughs> rolling him. so you got this guy with a huge ass being run around by this face on his ass and so i had a, i got an exorcist and we literally had the these guys they had got uh who was the guy who played max von Sydow? 
uh-huh. to play the part that he played in The Exorcist. <laughs> he was gonna he was gonna do a, a joke on himself, I guess. Yeah. And uh, he was he was going to uh, exercise. It. So I had exorcisms for everybody. And I thought, how do I exercise this demon out of his ass? So I had him <laughs> at one point chasing him, chasing the. Uh, the father with the big ass chasing him around this Amityville house with a, an enema bag <laughs> filled with holy water, right? Yeah. Well, the studio they had was a staunch Catholic, and he took and he got just so angry with that. I can I can understand that, uh, but he canceled the movie. He abruptly canceled it, and it wasn't until like a year or two later that the woman who at, at Disney who called me in who, who later became who, who were close friends still and uh, she said do you think you could write that for Disney you know do a Disney version of that movie and I said I don't see why not and that's what Mr. Boogity became oh my god yeah that ass demon thing was kind of used in scary movie too with James Woods was it? yeah I think this was before scary movie though I'm, I'm not know, sure. This is long I before. Had to, you know, what do you do? If, you know, when someone's possessed in their ass, I mean, yeah. how do you approach them? <laughs> <laughs> this is like 20 years before Scary Movie, yeah. I actually prefer Bride of Boogity the most because it has more characters, more plot, and I've actually interviewed two people from it. Um, it, oh. it was the one that used to be on all the time when I was a kid, you know. I actually... I, I actually didn't remember seeing the the first Mr. Boogity until like much later. Yeah, well, I wrote I wrote both. Yeah. Um, well, who was it that you interviewed? Uh, Tammy Lauren, who played the daughter in the second. Oh yeah, yeah. In <laughs> Ride of Boogity, and Karen Condazian, who plays the uh, fortune teller. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. named her after I named that character after my sister. Oh, she's she's she's, <laughs> she's very much a, she's uh, very much that character nice. in real life. I'll tell you. <laughs> She's no, she's a lovely lady, but she's very eccentric. But yeah, uh, Hollywood actors tend to be a lot of them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've talked to so many of them. You know, the ones who are actually normal. Those are the ones I cherish, though. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun because I got to. That was the one and only time I got to produce something as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed that. And that was like Leonard Fry's last movie before he died. Yeah, he was a nice guy, very nice guy. Yeah. How? Oh, how was yeah. Eugene Levy? I'm sorry. How was uh, working with Eugene Levy? I adored Eugene Levy. Cause I've been a fan of of his since forever. When that when he and what was it on the SCTV? It's called SCTV. SCTV. I loved yep. that show. It's brilliant. Oh yeah, he was—he is so damn funny. You know, when you're and nice, the nicer guy you'd never meet. He's nice, really nice. All—all all those Canadian performers are just drop dead hilarious. Yeah, they're the better side of us. <laughs> and they're very, yeah, very nice people too. You know, it just—they don't have the bitterness that American performers do. <laughs> Not usually. No, I haven't. He, he was—he was terrific. Yeah. Terrific. And uh, Richard and Richard uh, Richard Mazur, I mean, he must have been great. Yeah, he's he's very talented and, def- and versatile. Yeah. So did 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 it reach a point where where Hollywood and screenwriting just became uh, too much? So you left it. Uh, I kind of got I kind of you know that that love hate thing with Los Angeles. It was too big for me. I never did quite adjust to it. We moved out of Los Angeles and we moved to uh, Ojai and I was there for years. But eventually we just wanted to get back to Colorado and that was, when we did that, this, this again, that kind of sort of, it made it too hard to continue. Mm-hmm. It really does help to be in Los Angeles. Yeah. You know, I, I teach I teach online for UCLA a, a writing class, for a screenwriting class. And I, I tell you, you know, if you want to get into film, you really should try to go where they make the movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're, I like writing a book. 
you really should, you know, get to it. And if you can work on some movies and get, you know, even if a student film and, and, and learn some of the how movies are made and what goes into it, it'll help. I know. I've, I've you know, I've been telling people, you know, for, for a long time, you know, I want, you know, I, you know, I want to, you know, I have movies that I write and stuff, movies I want to do and stuff. And they all say to me, okay, come to, come to Los Angeles. And I was like, okay, can you give me a place to stay? And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they come, just, but don't stay with us, please. <laughs> yeah, they don't, they don't get it, you know. <laughs> yeah, but that's cool, though, that uh, you teach online. Do you, uh, were, you, were you teaching in person before the pandemic? Uh, no, not for UCLA. Oh, okay. I, ha- I, I have taught, back in Colorado, I taught a couple of classes in person. I don't, I don't, it's easier for me online, to be honest. Yeah. It's easier. That performance thing left me after I stopped doing theater. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess. How, so, how, so how long have you been up there for? In Eugene? In yeah. Oregon? Yeah. Um, at least a decade now. I really like it here. It's just a gorgeous place. Yeah, so you, I, you know, I, I walk three, four, five miles a day. <laughs> it's just nice. <laughs> yeah. Really my, do. my dad lives in I, Marysville. I don't mind the rain. Well, we don't get that much rain. It's not as much as advertised, but I, I like rain. Yeah, my dad lives in Marysville, Washington. He says it rains all the time over there. They're saying the Northwest is drying up this for the next few years. I just heard that on the radio yesterday, or today even. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, w- I wanted to ask you uh, really quickly, uh, what, what's your opinion of script consultants? Well, it depends on the script consultant. I, I have, I mean, I, that's part of what I do as a teacher, you know. Mm-hmm. is consult on scripts and, and so it really depends on who you get there and uh, how you work together it's almost like having you know a writing partner and if, if you don't get along or you don't see eye to eye then the script consultant this, this is going to be antagonistic it's going to be in conflict but it, uh, a script consultant where, you, where you're in sync can be really helpful don't you think? yeah I I have interviewed two script consultants and they were both full of shit. I'll tell you, the first one I talked to, right? I had um, there's there's a um, uh, an organization I'm sure you've heard of it. It's called Film Courage. No, haven't heard of it. Okay, it's based in 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 L A. and they have a YouTube channel where they interview uh, people in the industry, filmmakers, uh, directors, mm-hmm. actors, and so forth. And uh, she did this interview where she was very blunt, very honest, and I thought, ah, she could, she'd be a very um, good interview, right? Well, I interviewed her. Not only was she very rude, she was very bitter, and she just, she, like, contradicted a lot of stuff she said to me, you know. As it turns out, she's the uh, niece of a, um, of a famous Hollywood producer who she didn't want to name because he never helped her in the industry. And so after, you know years of trying to get a a script made she became a script consultant and um i didn't enjoy that 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 interview particularly and then the next one i interviewed she was very very nice but just like her contradicted a lot of stuff she said she had you know they both had this i'm not at liberty to discuss this kind of attitude and stuff and it's just like oh my god there's, there's, there's people out there like that yeah that you see on the internet and actually the first one, a couple of her clients actually contacted me and, and told me that um, told me how mean she is and how shady she is and that you know she screws people out of money. Uh, yeah. Sounds like the producer of Philadelphia Experiment. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why yeah so that's why I I, I wanted to ask uh, about that because yeah I just I I, I have a, a very low opinion of script consultants based on that you know. Well, you know, I have never worked with a script consultant, but I consider, you know, when I work with all these students online with their scripts, mm-hmm. that I'm consulting with them. I, you know, I, I try to find things that I can do to encourage them and to help them. And, uh, but it's, it, basically, I tell them in the end, it's your story, it's your script, that you make all the decisions. I can, all I can do is 
is uh, make suggestions and and uh, encourage you. That's what I try to do. Oh, that's good. Um, that, that's good that you do that, Michael. It really is. Yeah, it's hard enough. I mean, it, you, you know, all you, all the writers are looking for is an excuse not to write. Usually. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. And yeah. so you don't want to do that. You don't want to provide that it, that excuse. You want to encourage people to do to push themselves and and to trust themselves. Yeah. It, in the it, end. The, the writing process can get tedious, especially if uh, you don't know what direction you're going in. I have two, two things that I'll tell you and some, and some that are good advice for writers. Mm-hmm. One is whatever works. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is try to be entertaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that got me through one interview I had. I had no idea. I, I got called in. This is a this is a sequel to Philadelphia Experiment, mm-hmm. and I got called in at the last minute by the so-called producer guy. I mean, like the night before, and I think it was around Christmas time too. I think yeah. it was like the day before Christmas, and I had to come up with an idea overnight, and then and then drive into Los Angeles and pitch this thing, uh, and uh, and I thought, why am I doing this? Well, we need money. Okay, so I did it. I did it. I go in there. And there's only like two people there, and they both look like they're in high school, <laughs> and they're waiting. And they get, I finally get called up there. I had, I had still had worked out what I was going to say. I knew that there were, they wanted to do something that had to do with the moon, and so I thought, how am I going to do this? And, I, and I, I had no idea. So as I'm walking up the stairs, literally I had to walk up these stairs. I said, try to be entertaining. <laughs> so I told myself. <laughs> And I, I use that as a guide, and somehow I got through it. I don't know how I did. I mean, I was improvising all the whole way. And there was one guy there from Disney. Uh, it, it, he was probably the only professional. <laughs> <laughs> he pulled me aside afterwards. He said, that's the best pitch I've ever heard. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> I don't know. I tried to be entertaining. That was the only thing that was guiding me. That because I had no idea how I was going to get the first half of the movie to sync up with the second half, and I still don't know how I did it. Mm. Well, Michael... You, uh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, a writer writes, and that's all you can really do. And, you know, thank God for computers now, um, because, I mean, typewriting was good, you know, but I think computers is, is much better much easier to, to revise. Yeah. I mean, I heard the story about George Lucas. I mean, he hand-wrote Star Wars, and that's just insane. And he did it on an envelope, right? I think so, yeah. <laughs> the whole movie. Um, George Lucas was a fabulously um, talented guy, even though he went to USC. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get rejected by USC? No, I was accepted by both, which, mm-hmm. is, which astonished me. At yeah. The time. I just, I, I thought, huh, private school, I'm going to go to the, you know, the people's school. <laughs> you know, yeah. Oh, and I just remember, too, he was taught by Jerry Lewis at USC. Is that right? I'm not surprised. Yeah. Jerry Lewis, I thought, I, 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 I thought he was connected to USC in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you you could have had a, a totally different experience if if you were one of his students. <laughs> yeah, it would have been interesting. I mean, he has a lot to tell people. He did. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Uh, how, it's amazing I how. I asked he, him at that when I, when I went to see him. Yeah. Uh, and we were sitting way in the back because you know he hadn't come. We hadn't talked to him before, and we were just staying, my, Sally and I were in the back of the auditorium, and the rest were up front right to hear the master's voice and uh someone asked me that you saw this movie right yes so what did you how did you come up with that donut scene where where he walks into the supervisor's office and there's donuts yeah he keeps eyeing the donuts and he said oh there were donuts on the set you know we just sort of improvised it and and sally and i looked at one another it was in my script (laughs) god Oh my God! People who who take so, credit, uh, yeah. Well, there you go. 
Yeah, and then of course he 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 uh, he he references it like two more times throughout the movie as a gag, you know, including when he gets punched by the boss. <laughs> if you mention donuts one more time. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't. Well, you know, that's the thing with with a person with a he's got the talent and he's got the and he's got the celebrity, so he's got the ego. And so it takes over sometimes. And he probably believed he did improvise it. Yeah, oh yeah, some um, some people are like that in comedy. They think that they that they uh, wrote, you know, something that they took, you know? Well, they forget where they came across the idea. You know, he skimmed through my script, maybe he saw this and, you know, okay. And then later on it comes up, he, oh, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> I'm glad I thought of that. <laughs> Well, Michael, I thank you so much for coming on today, and I'm, I'm glad uh, you're enjoying uh, teaching online. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and I uh, are you still doing your comedy? Um, I've kind of put that on the back burner the last couple of years, um, you know, especially even now with the pandemic and everything, you know, uh, comedians are doing, you know, um, drive-ins and outdoor stuff, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know if I, if I ever want to do that, but, uh, there, you know, never say never, so we'll see. Well, when you have friends, <laughs> we all <laughs> hopefully do, your comedy talent still is used. Absolutely. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's not like it's in vain or wasted. Yeah, that's so, true. Try to be entertaining. Yeah, <laughs> try to be entertaining is right. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, real quick, uh, is, there, is, is have you written anything that uh, you hope to get made someday? Well, I was, you know, funny when I was, when you were, when you were, uh, when I was getting ready for this, I had a, I, I thought, you know, I should look over what I have down on my computer and stuff to remind me of stuff. And I looked at some, a lot of the ideas I had written down. But that's not a bad idea. I should develop that. I wrote a story once about a guy who was disappearing. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, uh, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful not, what is it? It's a Wonderful Life? Is that what it's called? Yes. On Christmas and the Clarence and the Angel. And he says, this is what life would be without you, George. Jimmy Stewart. Remember that? Yep, Jimmy Stewart. And it's all of a sudden he sees life for him. And I thought, what if it happened slowly where you disappear? <laughs> and you saw yourself disappearing, but it was in slow motion. That would be a horror movie, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And so I put it together, and it is. It's a scary movie when you start to see, you know, gradually people don't see you, and you're gradually fading from the scene, and where, where are you headed? That was that was a movie that was, I, I did write a version of it, and it's, it's something that still interests me. Well, I hope you, you get it made, and thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, and, and congratulations for doing, you know, such an endeavor. Thank you, I try. <laughs> You're doing fine. You're doing great. Thank you so much. You, you have a great day. Thank you, you too. Bye okay. now. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Michael Janover. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, what a nice man, huh? Very passionate about writing. Looks at it from an artistic standpoint. Probably the nicest screenwriter I have interviewed. And it was a pleasure to interview him today. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. <laughs>